And now we continue with a debate. Um, or let's call it a debate. Serinko, come on stage. Serinko is a devil in Nim. And Altea is head of comms in privacy and scaling explorations. Give, give them a small applause. And I will bring chairs. Uh, you can intro yourself, and I will bring chairs. All right. Good afternoon, comrades. Hello. It's been warm here, I see. Uh, it's, a, it's a tradition of Web3 Privacy Now events, but we love that. I'm Serinko, I'm Devrelin Nim. Um, well, this is gonna save me some time. I'll get a presentation later on Nim, so I'm not gonna talk about Nim right here, right now, too much. I've been anonymity enthusiast by nature, privacy researcher before, uh, supporting projects as external, like uh, DarkFi, uh, a little bit LunarDAO with some guides, and I've been working in Nim as a Devrel. Please. Um, I'm Althea. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, my background, I suppose, is in art and writing. Um, and I've been in the crypto space for about six years now. I work with the privacy and scaling explorations team at the Ethereum Foundation. I'm a coordinator across design, communications, and ecodev teams. Yeah, cool. Um, and this uh, talk we would dedicate with generally speaking, how to help builders create the better solutions and how to help them to kind of like solve more complex and more actual issues. And I will start with super, uh, like the first question would be super fun and actual that you asked me before. How you define who is the builder? All right, I guess I'll start because it was my question. Um, so I, I think that we, we often talk about builders kind of too narrowly. We use it to mean developer, which is obviously one very important role in, in building technology. But um, there are also designers, there are communicators, there are community builders, there are the people who kind of build the, the social infrastructure around all of these things and kind of build the bridges to the people that we hope will use them and also kind of bring that information back to the people who are writing the code about what what stuff is getting used for, what the needs are, what the challenges are, and kind of like uh, all of these people translating for each other, translating from human to machine and back again. I think all of those roles are, are building roles. Yeah, I think it's been said. Uh, to me, builder is anyone who contributes um, to the structures which are um, expanding the space within which um, freedom can, uh, can nourish. That can go from devs all the way to, uh, you know, people in, in community, very importantly so, and not to just give like the GitHub contribution marks, uh, which can be empty commits, but look what's actually the result and what's the aim of what people are doing. And then the question would be like, okay, uh, at what certain moment you understand that person or a group of people doesn't contribute meaningfully. And in that sense, how you would define how the organizations, foundations, uh, projects, protocols should measure valuable contribution versus not that valuable? And what, what is this borderline between when the builders are really delivering, are really scaling, are really empowering, versus uh, it's just a noise around and it's not really meaningful for the goal, vision, and the story behind the project. Maybe Srinko, you can uh, mention your Lunar Down these experiences, like because you participated in decentralized organizations and they are much more trickier in terms of measuring the contributions. Well, yes, I participated externally as a part of a community um, helping with some guides on, I think, some of the solutions, existing solutions, which, um, you know, they aggregate in a wiki um, so people can find them easily in one place, but also kind of one-on-one, -on -one how to use them and what's the references to them. This has been actually an interesting discussion because that goes through some, you know, community discussion of how to choose those um, projects. Another part of the Learner DAO, which uh, I'm not part of is, you know, to be investing in the projects which are not existing just yet in their developer teams. Let's not talk about that. Um, that part is fully unknown, by the way. 
But maybe to your question, I think how organization decides within its own structure, they might have some OKRs, what have you, um, you know, some incentives, and they need to make themselves exist in the end, sell themselves one way or the other, make themselves useful. But whether an entire organization or project is contributing, being useful in building um, something which expands the space of uh, freedom or what we, you know, autonomy or parallel structures. I think the only duality and later on history will judge whether, whether that's actually the case or not. And I think for that, we need to put questions what we actually doing and how start within ourselves, among ourselves and the culture we have, how much we using the things which we building. Whether that's again building as devs or building as community managers, building as marketing, what have you. But do we actually use and do we find useful in other people's we go to all these many conferences, all these primitives, protocols, as solutions, are they actually solutions to the problems we're facing or not? And I think that's a question, that's an angle to look on things to help us to judge ourselves from presence and the reality in which we add and not let kind of like the, the tyranny in future decide that in history it was useless. Does it make sense? Yeah, pretty much. What do you think, Altair, on maybe also an angle of privacy and scanning explorations, how you define if the things you were doing or your team members are worth trying and how you select the cost? Because generally speaking, you're also doing lots of R&D. And in R&D, you can do R&D for years or like decades, hundreds, like just tr keep on trying. How you how you would recommend builders to define the meaningful way forward? Yeah, POC is, is kind of an odd case because we're, uh, we generally work in a very kind of experimental mindset and, and so there's like, um, like failure isn't even necessarily a problem when you're doing an experiment. If it doesn't turn out how you thought it would, then you've just learned something, right? We're not trying to like necessarily build a product that will have a billion users. If that happened, that would be cool, but that's not necessarily uh, like our like first or primary goal. Um, but I think that there's still, there are kind of experiments that are worth kind of carrying forward and ones that kind of go nowhere. Um, but it is, it's difficult to put numbers on things, or I, I think a lot of the like metrics that you could point to don't end up actually being that useful, like likes on Twitter or GitHub stars or like uh, uh, things that are kind of like countable often um, are like more of a distraction. You end up kind of like playing for likes instead of trying to actually build a thing that is like as novel or as useful or whatever as it could be. Um, so, I mean, to me, some of the things that, like, get me really excited about a project or, like, feel like something is going somewhere is, like, it's not necessarily how many people use it, but, like, how much of an impact does it have on the people that use it? Does it do something that nothing else could? Does it, like, fill a need that nothing else had? Um, is it, do people take what you've built and then build on it? Do they like take it to places that you didn't expect? Do they experiment with it in ways that like you didn't predict? Um, and like, do they kind of like take ownership? Do they take it and run with it? And does it have longevity or is it just kind of like something that people go, oh cool, and then use it once and never think about it again? Um, and those, those things are all kind of difficult to quantify. Um, then let's talk about a bit uh, financial sources for the builders because lots of the in independent builders, they're in this situation, they need to go for bounties, grants, um, hackathons and stuff to kind of like uh, pave their own wave. And I've seen that within lots of the privacy hackathons, lots of solutions, they just die after the hackathon. So they're like no, no post hackathon development of the projects. And there's one, the different take uh, which uh, project was made last ETH burn noise a bloom wallet that was generally speaking is the same uh, solution to RPCs and stuff but through Tor uh, like wallet with Tor integration and you have anonymity uh, or pseudonymity 
and they continue to develop and maintain the project for one more year. It's still under develop, uh, development. There's no VCs and stuff. But how you would uh, recommend builders to where to put uh, the right efforts to sustain the idea in more like uh, at, at least let's say mid run, not long term run, but maybe mid term. How they should approach this kind of like tricky thing of where to find money and how to sustain the project and move forward. I mean, this is just kind of a problem of open source generally, <laughs> right? Like, where does the money come from if everything is free? Um, and I think grants and bounties can be really great sources for something to get started, but it isn't really a sustainable model. And I don't know that I actually have an answer here, I think, and, and I'm, like the team that I'm on, I kind of have the luxury of not having to think about it all of that much. And like we do give out a lot of grants, but they're kind of grants to try something out, not not to like start a business and come up with a revenue model and try to do something that will <laughs> last for years. And I, I think it just it is actually very challenging to think about how to make something that is like private, open source free and somehow also brings in money. So I think it's kind of a challenge for it, like for individual developers, but also for like this space as a whole to figure out how to support the things that we think are important. Serenko? Well, how a lot of world spins is that you work on something for a long time, you prove that you can do that in a smaller scale, and then based on that, you go to people who might wanna support you in doing that in bigger scale, right? Um, to give you some ramp. How the tech, in particular crypto works, is um, you think about something, you write it on a paper, and before you start to do anything, you go with that paper to all different people, and you hope that they're gonna believe that paper, that you're gonna turn that paper into code or into um, an anything which you're building. Um, I mean, there is a certain advantage because that means that you can actually create, you know, like put a thought, um, in sort of white paper, what have you, and get support like that. On the other hand, obviously, there is a massive competitions because this is an, many people figure out that this is a low threshold entry, so there's a lot of charlatans, a lot of snake oil, and honestly, sometimes I'm surprised, but pardon me for, excuse me for my French, but what kind of bullshit is getting what type of figures of money in crypto industry and what honest projects are not getting supported? But we cannot just sit here and like cry about it, right? Like we gotta think, okay, projects need to figure out their incentives models um, and preferably present them in early stage as well because crypto do allow that permissionlessly. Um, you don't have to, you know, go after banks and something, but of course there is this big VC game and chasing investors. But you can replace that by, by a DAO, for example. If, you know, if you create um, community, and primitive working enough that's not gonna be just like a donation based, like donate <coughs> through the DAO anonymously to something, it's gonna be good, but you figure out your incentive model as a part of the proposal, then you kinda like make a DAO or any sort of um, formation like that being part of taking the risk and taking a possible benefit of that thing you're working on. And I think that, that can quite change a game in a position of like, you go to a VC or a few VCs which um, can massively help but can also harm a project because one day, especially if you're building privacy things, um, jurisdictions in within which you started or made your um, legal contracts and stuff will change the laws and the VCs will come to you and be like, you kinda gonna like, you know, creep your mission a little bit. And once you start a little bit, um, usually that means the game's over. And then you come to the thing we talked about before, you're gonna actually build something it's gonna be completely useless. It's gonna be some another balloon of, if you're lucky, money, but not, no solution for actually any use case. And then we are in this situation when protocols sometimes, or a projects or foundations think that builders would come and propose wonderful ideas. And in many hackathons we see that it's a random, certain randomizer. And uh, not many builders could imagine the right use case that Sirinka said will solve a specific need that is actual now instead of wishful thinking in the future 
that maybe is not applicable even now, or will have lots of external boundaries. Like, what uh, recommendations you would give to builders to where to find the right use cases, how to dig into right use cases, where they should come from? You should listen to people. <laughs> And you should listen to designers and community builders and communicators and the people who live in the places where you think that your tools are going to be used. Like, I feel like crypto is so kind of <laughs> enamored with, uh, I don't know, what I call the field of dreams approach. Like, I'll just build it and it's so cool that someone will surely understand and come and use it and then I don't have to explain anything about it or connected to anything that anyone values. It's just, it's so amazing. Surely the users will just happen. But I think there's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of disconnect from the like reality of most of the world. And like Syringa was saying earlier, like we don't even use our own stuff. We don't even like interrogate ourselves about what our needs are and how they would be addressed or or how like these kinds of tools would actually make things better for even ourselves let alone like people that we haven't met yet yeah sometimes sometimes it reminds me like um kind of bad salesman marketing who doesn't believe uh, his her own project uh we talk about things on stage on conferences then the time's over and we go back to our lives and you know it's like you selling some like think you don't like so much and then your life is kind of like, now I'm off that, right? I'm not no longer selling donuts or <laughs> what have you. Um, and I think we can reflect on how this is happening within our own community and our, our, own, co our own culture, sorry. It was a really good talk with, um, Richard Stallman held a talk on HCPP just a few days ago. And behind him was like a QR code with uh, Q and A you know, scan it, send the questions, and then the moderator brings the questions, and Richard is like, hold on, hold on, there is a QR code. How between the QR code and the questions being read here, they got to me, right? Um, and he's a pro like massive programmer, like a legend, but he's like, I would even prefer a written paper of people just raising hands, even though I don't hear so much. The organizer says, well, they were sent through, you know, through the application, which is behind the QR code. He's like, was that application a free software. Uh, yeah. Was that application free software? Well, Richard, it wasn't. Okay, delete all those questions. Who's got a questions here? This is hardcore, right? But on the other hand, like if we look at it and we are like, why do we not use the solutions we, we're building? Is it because they aren't solving any problems, but at the same time, like when we go to conferences like this, we hear about those problems all the time. Um, Mikola has been talking about it quite a bit that we talk about it like if there is like a super scary, only dystopian world and create fear. Seems like there is enough problems and we are aware of them. So then how do we connect that and how do we create culture within which we're not talking about something and next minute we just like browsing everything through Google Docs and you know, shit applications which are run by who knows who. So I think even address that and start to actually do tech, which is actually useful, but also put effort in education because there's something, especially the newer generations, the younger devs and stuff, there's been raised through schooling where everything is running on this proprietary software. So I like DarkFi approach in that, that they might sound hardcore and they go everything through command line and stuff, but they put a lot in education and a reasoning why to start doing our own stuff from like very basis of things. And there needs to be a cultural and paradigm shift in understanding that. It's not gonna be easy, but those of us who sit in this room can become like leaders on understanding and explaining them to the others. And I think that's our role, first of all. Uh, we talked before with Alan from Railgun about um, that I pointed that because of Vitalik's paper, Many people will go to Ethereum and like, oh, Vitalik is into privacy. Now we're investigating into privacy. Now we are doing privacy things. So there will be this kind of like uh, the Vitalik followers who knows that uh, or uses his bets like signals on what will be the next big thing. So lots of the kind of like a random people would come to the market. And where you would recommend in which directions to apply their whatever resources, uh, dev hours, like which type of technology maybe you 
would love to be better within the years, which type of challenges they should solve. Imagine someone who never been exposed to the space and suddenly is here and look around and try to choose direction. Which direction you would recommend for these people to go? That's, that's just a very broad question. I think it depends on what, what you care about, <laughs> um, what you're excited about. Um, and uh, yeah, are we talking about investors? Are we talking about developers? Are we just talking about uh, people? Okay, who we can start with developers and then move to investors, but start okay. with developers. I'm, I'm probably not gonna answer the investor question. I don't know, take your money <laughs> somewhere else. <laughs> I mean, I think for developers, there's, like, there's so many different, like very exciting things going on that I think you can just kind of look around and think like what matters to you and who is working on that in a meaningful way. Um, like there are some things that I could say I think are pretty exciting right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like um, one kind of general just like concept that I'm, I'm pretty interested in, in seeing developed right now is um, sort of using the cryptography that is already everywhere to to like take these not so private applications and and turn them into things that work in different ways like take people from familiar places into something a little bit more unfamiliar um, for example your email your gmail account your it's hotmail i don't know whatever people still use that um, there are like cryptographic signatures and cryptographic primitives built into these things or like the um, Adhar uh, identity system in India. So th like using those primitives in ways that they were not intended, using your, like the, the signature that's attached to your email to prove ownership of things or to send transactions. This is a real thing, it's called ZK email. It's actually really cool. Um, or like, or taking the um, like the massive anonymity set that is presented by like the pretty creepy Adhar system, and using that to sort of like subvert <laughs> that surveillance mechanism into something that is actually like privacy preserving and anonymous and has a, a certain kind of trust built in. Um, that kind of stuff is really interesting to me. Like taking things that feel familiar already and using them in ways that they were maybe not intended. Hacking. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would basically just be repeating what you said and what I said myself before. Uh, I hope not all your mathematician fellas will now walk away the room. Um, but I think the algebraic solution's not necessarily working, right? Like take, I, I make a solution and I have to start to be thinking like, oh, what kind of problem I have to create in order that solution to be working. <laughs> we got enough problems. Um, we got enough solutions which aren't working. And we got actually quite some solutions which do work. So I don't want to also spit on things. I really like uh, Jeremel's talk before here, how Wahim and other uh, folks in Dyn or pre-Dyn and ASSI were creating on technical level, but how it plugged into like social questions, whether it's locally or whether it's internationally. I think we can figure out lo also a lot of those problems. One of the things which I think crypto particular is doing is by any means trying to respond to social problems with a technological solution. And sometimes there's like a twist. So to also like realize where we actually standing on when we talk about politics and culture and when we actually talk about tech and not necessarily trying to solve one with the other. Um, I recently seen uh, of Jared Hope from Logos that they're building politically neutral uh, stack. And the question is like, should builders be political? Should what be political? Should builders be political to do the right tools? I mean, this is a, just an inherently political thing, right? I don't think that it, privacy is political. I don't think there's any getting away from that. And I think if you're talking about politically neutral infrastructure, you're not necessarily, like the act of building politically neutral infrastructure is quite political, <laughs> I think. The infrastructure itself might be sort of neutral to politics, but creating neutral spaces, creating private spaces, like 
protecting people or, or kind of giving people the, the tools to opt out of things, um, to like keep things to themselves, to lead independent autonomous lives. These are political acts. I don't think that there's any escaping that. That's not something we decided. That's just sort of the way that the world is. Yeah, I think political neutrality doesn't exist. Um, and that's not that it's one way or the other, but there is always what kind of people, which kind of places you choose to talk to will also define who's gonna benefit from the tech. You can do very similar things. You believe in some sort of tech solutions, whether it's coding, hardware and stuff. And if you would look from the outside, two people might be doing same things, except that one of them is gonna end up to be used for uh, nuking the entire town, while one of them is gonna end up to be in prison because they, use, they actually made a use case like a people from Tornado Cash, you know? So, yeah, if you look at them in a vacuum, it looks like an apolitical, neutral or something, but it's never like that. Who's financing that? Who's gonna be profiting from that? And what, what is actually, they got quite some philosophy behind that, whether I like it or not, but there is some. It's called the network states, which is not invented by the, those people, but it's, repre it's presented by them. It's actually surprising I didn't hear about the political neutrality. I would like to talk with them about that. <laughs> then uh, let's wrap up with your recommendations since it's ideological things we are doing here. Uh, what people slash their books, talks you would, you would recommend uh, for developers or builders or designers who came to ETH Rome to follow, read, dive into, to kind of uh, become more, I guess, ethical uh, builder in that a human rights sense or humanistic sense? Um, I could say a couple that have influenced me a lot. Um, one is, it's I guess an essay <laughs> called The Future Will Be Technical. You can find it at coolguy.website. It's kind of an old piece. It's really about secure scuttlebutt, but it actually really has shaped the way that I think about um, like people's relationship to technology and how it can make us more or less human depending on kind of how we approach it. Um, I feel like the sovereign individual is, it, it's almost a cliche to say it, but it is worth reading and I think in the, in the context of the kinds of things that we're building, it, it feels pretty important. Um, and I also, recently read one called Data and Goliath that I thought was pretty pretty informative about just kind of the, um, like the, the structures of the, the surveillance economy or like the, the surveillance state um, and how it affects the, like the ways that technology is built for better or worse. I haven't read now for a while, I must admit, except technical documentations, it's just a bit boring. But I think on the technical side, and think like, you know, how Linux works and any coding stuff like can be very useful. Um, but there is so much of that and people like focus on so much of different things. There's some stuff I'm not gonna be saying for not doxing, you know. Um, what I always like come to back to and I did actually this, uh, this spring is, uh, I don't know if you've read it, but it's actually quite nice. The Art of Loving um, by Eric Fromm and The Art of Warfare by Sun Tzu. Uh, these two coming together, I think it's actually always kind of like roots you down because both is, it sounds kind of like recipes, but in fact it's rather like a philosophical and like how you understand life and you can like apply it on like so many things. But for the rest, I would reserve for this talk probably. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot. Uh... Thanks a lot for coming and uh, I think the people could uh, make questions to you there in the room and uh, afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you.